about how you started in public service and what motivated you to run for office? So that's a big question for anybody. Um, and uh, when you serve in public office, you have a lot of time to think about it and a lot of experiences shape you along the way. For me, um, it starts, as you know, Madeline, in my parents' Chinese restaurant. And uh, I remember working side by side with my parents when I was a kid, eight, nine, 10 years old in our Chinese restaurant. And I worked nights and weekends. And I think a lot of people in our community share that experience um, as the children of immigrants uh, or the grandchildren of immigrants. And, and we know this experience uh, as small business people or recent immigrants. And, and uh, working side by side with them, I remember there was this door in the kitchen from, it was a pretty big restaurant kitchen to the dining room. And there was a diamond shaped window uh, in that door. And I would pass by that door hundreds of times a weekend. And that's the door that waiters and waitresses went through to go to the dining room. And I would look out that little diamond shaped window and I would see all the people in the dining room who were enjoying themselves and their families. And I was always keenly aware that there was a barrier and a door between me and all of them. And that my job and my parents' job was to serve them and that I wasn't a part of that community. And, and that sensation, uh, that feeling of, of being separated and disconnected has stuck with me my whole life. And it's always uh, motivated me to try to get through that door, sometimes kick through that door and get into the dining room and you know, frankly, to take the metaphor all the way out to get a seat at the table in the dining room. Um, I, I think that is my personal personal motivation and experience. And, and ultimately, I think as an Asian American, Asian Pacific American elected, you know, I think we talk a lot about empowerment and why it's important for us to engage and run for office and serve. Um, for me, it's understanding that uh, for much of our history and still today, Asian Pacific Americans are invisible to a lot of people. We're invisible in our political discourse. We're invisible in the now black, white, brown dynamic. You know, where do we fit in all of that? Where do we fit in the conversation about race and diversity? And sometimes I feel like, um, very often I feel like we're invisible and and forgotten. And so um, my motivation, I think the reason for serving and being here for this community and for all of us is to be seen and be heard and to be recognized and be a full partner in our political system here in this country. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, definitely something that we want um, to do as an organization is to uplift the community and, and let people know that uh, the API community is one that is a part of uh, the fabric of America. Yeah. Um, and just as a reminder to those people who are watching this, um, you can put your questions in the chat box. If you're watching us um, on Facebook, put them in the comment section. Um, so we'll have some time at the end to have um, the, uh, the general um, address those questions. Do, uh, I see a, do I see a chat box too? I don't know. Yeah, if you oh. um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, it, oh, I see. Have, okay, yep, there you go. Uh, so you know, Connecticut was one of the first states to issue a shelter in place order. Yeah. Um, and in these uh, current times, how do you encourage people to stay active as citizens? Um, so, <laughs> another difficult question and a complex one. Um, but there's a lot going on in this world right now. And you have to try to find ways uh, to virtually and remotely um, make your presence felt. And I, I'm, I'm actually working on a piece that I wrote about what it means to me and my wife to be parents and what we're learning and what our children are learning from distance learning, not just about school, but about ourselves and about our country. Um, and about my work as attorney general and, and what this whole pandemic and our response to it um, has taught me and what it means to all of us. And so I think if you can express yourself 
by writing, by participating uh, in this process, by advocating for candidates whom you support. Um, there's still a presidential campaign going on. So um, if you have a, a candidate or issues that you want to engage with, I think there's many ways to do that online and not just obviously in Facebook and social media, but by writing and weighing in and connecting with people. There are still primaries and there are still conventions and there are still elections happening. There's still peti petitioning drives in Connecticut. We have kind of an old school system. We have conventions. And then uh, if you don't qualify for the ballot at the convention, there are petitioning drives. We have to get signatures and then there are primaries and it's a very you know, old school New England kind of way of doing things. And so we're trying to figure out as a state, how do we do that when people can't effectively petition um, and, and do in place, uh, in, in, uh, in person signature collection. So those are difficult questions that we're trying to confront and being a part of the solution on that is another way that citizens can engage. Excellent, thank you for sharing those yeah. recommendations. Uh, prior to the shelter in place order, you and the governor had a meal at Shu, a Szechuan yeah. restaurant in West Hartford. Um, you know, you talked about your own parents and your own upbringing in a, uh, in a Chinese restaurant. Um, why did you feel it was important to have this meal there specifically? So um, it's heartbreaking to see people, leaders refer to this global health emergency as um, the Chinese virus or the Wuhan virus. It's disheartening to see people pointing fingers and it's very painful as Asian Pacific Americans to see us scapegoated or gaslighted or whatever the term is, but blamed for something that doesn't discriminate. Um, you know, this virus doesn't discriminate and it doesn't just affect Asian Pacific Americans. It doesn't just, uh, it isn't more risky in a Chinese restaurant or a Chinese supermarket or um, an Asian Pacific American community somewhere in this country, but there's a lot of misinformation, disinformation and hate out there. Um, and it bubbled up very quickly, you know, as it did at 9-11. And that brought back a lot of memories of people who were attacked and murdered and shot and killed during 9-11 because people perceived them to be terrorists uh, or, of, or of Middle Eastern descent uh, or Muslims, which of course in and of itself is also uh, very wrong. And so I felt like it was important for me to get out there and to speak because there's uh, relatively few of us, frankly, in, in high elected office. And if we don't speak, who will? And I always feel that that um, urgency, frankly. I mean, I think I think as Asian Pacific Americans and also as an Asian Pacific American elected, you're mindful that you don't want to be in every conversation the Asian Pacific American guy or woman, right? It, you, you don't want that to um, to cloud or distract from the issues or the points you're trying to make, but I'm always the Asian Pacific American elected, right? That's who I am. I wake up in the morning and that's who I am. And so on the other hand, I, I'm always, that's always present and, and I embrace it. And so that's why I felt like I needed to go to uh, a very good Sichuan restaurant in uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. I called the governor, he's like, let's go. We went, we had very authentic food. And I also wanted to support the small business owners that. They weren't just under pressure. They weren't just off 30%, most of them on their business. They were scared. Uh, and to have me uh, embrace them is one thing, but to make the governor come with me and sit there with them and break bread uh, meant an entirely different thing. And I think it was really important for them. And frankly, we weren't sure who would show up. The entire Hartford area Capitol Press Corps was there because people understood this. this was an important message that we were trying to send. We've seen um, an increase in physical and verbal attacks against Asian Americans uh, because they're being blamed for COVID-19. Yeah. Um, and you know, as the chief law enforcement officer for your state, uh, are there reported attacks um, 
and you know, when, when you see this, what do you recommend citizens do if attacked or if they are witness to an attack? You know, obviously if they're physically harmed or intimidated or threatened, they should call the police. Um, you know, other forms of intimidation or bullying, um, any kind of discrimination, they should report it to the appropriate government agency. So uh, if they, again, are physically, personally threatened or intimidated and, 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 they, and they're concerned about their safety, they should call their local police or the state police um, in their jurisdiction in, in, in their state, city or town. Uh, with respect to employment discrimination, if they feel like they're at work or they're teleworking and somebody is treating them poorly, um, they should go to their equal opportunity agency in Connecticut. It's the C Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. Um, the Attorney General's office uh, may also be a resource there. Um, if you feel like you've been prejudiced as a consumer, you can call the Attorney General's office uh, or the Department of Consumer Protection. And then, of course, there are a host of other agencies, each state probably has a Department of Labor, a Department of Insurance, a Department of Banking. Those are places where Asian Pacific Americans may uh, engage, do business, work, uh, perform some act or function that is under the jurisdiction of that agency. And if you feel like you have suffered an adverse um, action consequence because of your race or ethnicity, national origin, or 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 religion, you should report that and you should do it right away and you should make a paper record of it. It's so important for us to document this information because uh, public officials, um, public policy officials need that in, in the sense of um, seeing the aggregate and being able to address that when it's brought to them in that in uh, the formal um, in the formal state of a um, you know, documentation, you know, yeah. for the authorities. Um, and so there's um, a list of uh, websites that um, the community itself has um, created to report these hate crimes. Um, APAX has listed them um, in our most recent newsletter. Um, we can list them in um, the chat box for those people who are um, watching this, um, as well as in the Facebook live comments so that uh, you can share that with our community or, um, and so that uh, if people are more comfortable doing it with a more community-based organization, um, they can do that and those organizations will aggregate and um, uh, turn those over to um, uh, law enforcement. So um, it's so important for us to document it. I know it can be very uncomfortable for people to do that. There's some distrust um, in that we want people to feel more comfortable knowing that they're at least sharing that information with organizations that they, that they value. Yeah, and I think people wonder, particularly Asian Pacific Americans, whether it makes any difference, right? If I if I complain, will anybody hear me? And, and the answer is yes, they will. And in my own community, um, a uh, older Chinese American woman who's been here for more than 30 years, uh, went to the supermarket in my city and uh, the um, cash register uh, attendant, a checkout person who happened to be herself a woman of color asked her, are you from China? And she said, yes, but I haven't lived there for 30 years. And then she took out some uh, Lysol and started spraying the woman and her entire workstation and groceries. And I, I mean, that's, that's just horrible, traumatic, um, humiliating, it, threatening. It's all of those things. And I'm really proud of that woman, frankly, for... Um, having the presence of mind to email the attorney general's office and say, this happened to me and we're trying to help her. And we've already reached out to the supermarket and um, it makes a difference to the supermarket and its manager when the attorney general's office calls. Uh, and so this is another reason why, frankly, not that you wouldn't get that result from uh, another attorney general, but it's a reason why it's important to elect APIs to elective office because then people who share our experience will hear us. You know, as someone who has uh, achieved statewide office, you know, what do you have as a uh, number one tip for anyone who is a first time candidate? Uh, I think both Madeline and others on 
this call who have been with me uh, almost every step of the way, my, my, my best advice is stick with it. Um, the key is to win more than you lose and to win at the right time. But um, you will lose and I have lost and you will see disappointment and people will, they will doubt you, they will underestimate you, you will have haters, we all do. Um, I think a lot of people, even Asian Pacific Americans have a hard time conceiving of other Asian Pacific Americans in elective office period, um, but they have a hard time seeing and envisioning Asian Pacific Americans on high elective office. And I'm really grateful for Grace Mung and Tammy Duckworth and Ted Liu and Andrew Yang and all the people that are breaking through. Every time they uh, move forward, um, it really makes a huge difference for all of us, but you have to stick with it. You're gonna get knocked down many, many times. You gotta get right back up. I mean, that brings the question to, um, you know, resilience, you know, how, what, you know, what sort of fortitude did you find within yourself to be able to pick yourself back up? Um, my family, my parents, um, the, I've been very fortunate and I've been very lucky. And um, I've told this story and uh, Madeline, you've heard it, I think in some speeches I've made here and there, but but I tell the story about how I was knocking doors one day and this was my first race and I was exhausted and I was drenched in sweat. And I came back and my mom was with us, like a good Chinese grandmother. She was uh, uh, taking care of our newborn at the time, our first, Eleanor, who's now 14, if you can believe it. But um, Eleanor was a baby. And I said, you know, mom, I don't know if I can do this. And she goes, why? And I said, well, you know, today wasn't great and people weren't that friendly at the doors and, uh, you know, it's hard. She goes, everything's hard. And I said, yeah, but, you know, I'm scared about losing this one. And she got really angry. And my mom said, ni pasima, which in Chinese translates to, what are you afraid of? Um, and you know, what she was saying to me in that instance was, you have nothing to be afraid of. You have everything going for you. And, um, you know, my mom and my dad made incredible sacrifices. And, and they and my grandparents, you know, they went through hell and back to get here. Um, and I think recognizing that we have we have real opportunities in this country and the privileges of our citizenship and and you know, growing up here and, and knowing that, you know, it's not perfect, but the political system is open to us. Um, you know, that's a tremendous opportunity and, and we have nothing to be afraid of and we should just press forward. You know, thank you so much for sharing that because I think it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge for people to, you know, take that first step to run for office, you know, the first time it's even more challenging when uh, you don't have a successful run and continue to do it. Um, and then you find you know, the right office that fits your skills and, and values and, and what you wanna do. So I you know, appreciate you sharing um, that's such a personal story about your own experience. Um, so if there's any questions for um, General Tom, please put them in the chat box, please put them um, on the Facebook uh, comment section. We'll be able to grab those from you. Um, you know, in the meantime, you know, being that you are sort of, you know, at the stay at home stage, you know, how, how are you able to, you know, manage your, you know, public life versus private life because of the fact that you're just in one place now? So um, it's been a struggle finding the right balance. And as the attorney general, I have decided that the best thing I can do is model what every citizen should do, which is to listen to the governor and follow his executive orders and stay safe and stay home and minimize my um, my public contact and, and activity. So um, I have a greatly reduced uh, in-person schedule. I do go to the office, um, not every day, uh, because I um, instructed my staff to go home about three and a half weeks ago and telework from home. And so, um, I do go in uh, during the week, but not every day. And I try to be active 
uh, on on platforms like like this. I will say um, it, it's interesting, you know, everybody has their lane. And in this moment, the attorney general's job is to protect consumers and protect residents and support the governor in issuing these executive orders. And that results in a, uh, a lot of interest in what we're doing. So I uh, have um, had to convert my bedroom into a place where I can do these Zoom calls and interviews. Um, I was joking with General Shapiro of Pennsylvania. We uh, were talking and he was talking about how he had to do the same thing because um, for me, my bedroom is the only quiet place in the house uh, where, and I'm sure one of my kids is gonna bust through that door at any minute now. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's challenging, but uh, we're making it work. It wouldn't be a work from home situation if there wasn't a, a pet involved, a little person, right. or a bigger person walking in. So um, I definitely feel you when it comes to, to that um, situation. Um, we've got a few more uh, minutes left. Uh, sure. I, I would say uh, for my last question, really, for you, um, you know, being in this time, it really requires, um, you know, some depth of character to be able to still stay positive, continue making sure that, you know, your team um, feels that they are um, engaged and working towards a purpose um, when a lot of times people are feeling a little bit despair. Um, how, what do you, um, what does it mean to be a resilient leader in these times? Hmm. I, I think a couple of things. One is to always have perspective um, on a number of fronts. You know, I'm very fortunate that I get to work at home, that I have a job, um, that the people I work with are employed and they have a job and they're economically secure and that we are housing secure, income secure, food secure, and there are people who are not. And, and um, frankly, uh, there are many more people, I think, who are struggling right now, who are food insecure, right? Who um, may have lost their jobs or at risk of losing their jobs. Um, they're watching their small businesses um, um, get crushed by the, the length and, and the scope of this pandemic and the response. So I, I you know, I, I am, I, I've been saying that I, I think my kids have toughened up a bit because we all recognize that a lot of people have it tougher than we do. Uh, and I think vulnerable and um, vulnerable communities and people, um, many vulnerable communities and people in our Asian Pacific American community um, are having a really tough time right now. So, so have have perspective when you wake up in the morning. And, and I think um, that helps. Uh, the second thing I would say is have perspective that we've been through this before. And not that long ago, um, we went through 2008, 2009. I, I remember how that felt, how we weren't sure whether um, the financial system was going to completely crash. And people were talking about runs on banks and, 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 and catastrophic events and we've been at this precipice before uh, and then of course you know i was on a train on 9 11 on my way to the city uh when we got turned around and that day um was horrible for all of us and and the loss of life profound but the loss of life from covid is has well exceeded that and um, I think just to have perspective and to be grateful is one way to make it through. Uh, we have a question from my predecessor, Floyd Mori, who wants to know if there's um, other than you know that incident that you just mentioned in the grocery store, um, have you had any other you know an uptick in confrontations um, with anti-Asian racism, you know, specifically to, you know from the onset of um, COVID nineteen? Yes, we have complaints and um, videos of people mostly in retail stores of things happening to them um, and uh, everything from, you know, an insult to some bullying. Um, online is really a, frankly, a savage place where people um, really try to hurt each other. And, and I think that that is not just sad, but a law enforcement challenge long-term that we're trying to 
understand and master. So yeah, it's there. It's painful. Um, so we do have a question from uh, Michael Zhu, who is currently a college student who is who has dreams of someday leading in state government um, and uh, in a position like yours. Um, what advice can you give for someone who sees the lack of API representation in legal administration and wants to do something about that? I think just find a point of entry and start working. Um, I've been very fortunate to have been, I, I talked about earlier being invisible, um, which is something that we confront every day uh, as Asian Pacific Americans. But I've also been very lucky, uh, despite that, to have had a number of mentors along the way who are not Asian Pacific Americans. And it, I got very lucky that that a number of them became very senior elected officials. So um, I got started working for the then attorney general who had no chance of becoming a, a United States Senator. Uh, and he was running a fool's errand campaign and he won by one percentage point. And his name was Joe Lieberman. And I was 15 years old. And, you know, along the way, people like Senator Lieberman, uh, Mayor Malloy in my own city became Governor Malloy. And, and he is another really, really important mentor. So get engaged, find mentors, learn and and be ready. And um, I, I think if my experience has taught me anything, uh, you don't you don't know how this is going to go, and you can't draw it up in the sand. And um, I, I think if you told me and people that work with me that um, you know three or four or five years ago that I would be attorney general today, that wasn't even on my radar. Uh, never thought it would be possible. Never thought it would open, and it did. Um, and because of the work that we had done and um, because we were ready and because I had served and I had taken, you know, I'd really invested in my time in the legislature over 12 years, when the opening uh, opened and, and when the former attorney general uh, announced his retirement, we were ready. And so I started that race as the front runner and I ended as the attorney general. And you know, that was the product of years and years of work and getting to that position. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your insight and advice for others um, during this time. Um, we really want to um, also put in a plug for APACS because, you know, we are here as a resource to the API community for exactly that. Um, we have these wonderful leadership trainings, um, which we will be doing virtually for the time being so that people can still gain those skills. Um, we have our next webinar scheduled for April 21st with Dr. Wen, um, and she's going to talk a little bit more about public health. Um, and we also have um, a campaigning during COVID-19 webinar scheduled for next Friday. Um, so you know, definitely sign up for these opportunities on the APEX website. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next opportunity. Thank you so much, um, General Tong, for joining Thank you, us Madeline. today. Um, and we look forward to seeing everyone soon, hopefully. So um, everyone take care and look forward to you. Look forward to seeing you online again. Stay safe and healthy. Take care, everyone.